Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com. S T R E N G T H G U I L D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the per- first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm a nutrition scientist and an exercise physiologist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. This is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. I'm a strength coach, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete. That's about it today. (laughs) Nothing else today. (laughs) Nah, just not highly caffeinated. (laughs) Ah, that'll do it. Uh, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson, associate professor of the Kerrigan Institute, creator of the Flex Diet Cert and the Fizz Flex Cert, a bunch of other stuff. And today we're joined by Andrew Hefferman. Say hi. Hi, folks. I am a, a trainer and a writer in many media outlets with a uh, general pop fitness focus. Uh, I've co authored a couple of different fitness books and um general fitness nerd sweet awesome and so we'll be talking to andrew a little bit more about his origin story coming up in a bit after some studies and then in the topic of the day we're going to discuss kind of the distribution of information maybe a little bit more from a magazine slant since andrew has the the inside track so can you how do you know what to look for in magazine articles? Is there better or worse places to get information and a little bit on the process of that now? Yeah, I Great. like that. I like the topic. Yeah. It's timely. Um, not that long ago, I was, I was going back and forth with a Gen Pop editor, and I was not agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot. All right. Um, I just have two uh, fairly simple papers here to talk about. Strength and Muscle Sport News. These are from outlets that are not Gen Pop. Well, they're sort of quasi-lay, right? Quasi-professional. Um, Medical News Today. There's uh, Gina Smiley or Gianna Smiley. Uh, International study links ultra-processed foods with IBD risk. So, of course, for a long time, gastroenterologists, fitness people, everybody kind of gets the idea that highly processed diets are problematic. Although, let me be fair, Mike and I have been to enough IFT meetings, the Institute of Food Technologists, that they'll quickly point out there's a lot of good things about food processing, too. We can't automatically assume it's all bad all the time. But so they, they but we have an operational definition here. But it says a spike in inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, prevalence worldwide parallels an uptick in western dietary patterns. And I think a lot of people know in the western world, you know, the U- UK, the US, Australia were not paragons of virtue with the way we eat, um, especially the United States. It says a recent multinational study provides good evidence that regularly consuming highly processed foods um, in those uh, situations, IBD is more prevalent, uh, especially in affluent countries, right, compared with those with maybe a median income. So their uh, Niraj Narula, uh, medical doctor at Mac, right, McMaster in Hamilton there up in Canada, uh, just published a paper with his team in the British Medical Journal, Uh, Just a little bit of background. It says, Narula and his team assessed the medical data of more than 116,000 adults that were 35 to 70 years old. Uh, The participants came from 21 different nations. I mean, worldwide. There's a huge list here. Let's just say worldwide. Uh, The participants completed a food frequency questionnaire. So the first thing I think of is not causal, right? This is going to be an observational study. 
Um, there's not a direct intervention kind of thing, but you know, it could point to studies like that. Um, they reported uh, that all types of packaged and formulated foods and beverages that contain food additives, artificial flavorings, colors, or other chemical ingredients were essentially considered processed. Now, sometimes I, I raise an eye when I hear chemical ingredients because all ingredients are chemicals. <laughs> Let's keep that in mind. But I get, I get their point. Uh, colors, preservatives, things like that. They do. They're very good about in this uh, write-up here from Medical News Today saying they couldn't create you know, a causal link here just observational paper um, and they, and they don't also answer why why do highly processed foods like we eat in the states why are they so inflammatory it says they hope for future studies can figure out the mechanism by which ultra processed foods might trigger uh, irritable bowel disease but um, he feels that the consumption of low quality food disturbs the gut microbes which weakens the immune system and causes the inflammatory overreactions uh, behind many common diseases so not surprising i don't think i mean i'm automatically thinking about the huge uptick in like omega-6 fats that we consume i know different researchers i've spoken to have different thoughts on that but uh, huge uptick in linoleic acid the key omega-6 in the uk us you know, australia in recent decades and that that is, in fact, a substrate for inflammation. So it could be a lot of these sort of junk, what I would call junk fats, um, you know, trans fats as well. Uh, who knows about the additives of different kinds? So highly processed foods um, getting slammed, in this case, for IBD, not just the usual, you know, diabetes, heart disease, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Mike, do you have a lot of clients that have IBD or gut issues? Um, a couple. Um, I would say it's more more common than not. A lot of times just asking them about digestion, because especially more general population people almost assume that bad digestion is normal. So you're like, hey, how's your digestion? Oh, it's fine. Like, oh, and then you get into asking a few more questions. You're like, that's not fine at all. Interesting. That's really bad. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so it seems like it's becoming more common for who knows what reasons. Mm -hmm. What about you, Phil? I mean, you guys, you work with some pretty elite people. Are they so fit they have less gut problems? Or, you know, of course, hard, real hard overtraining people, they might have more gut problems. What do you see in this in this regard? Mm, yeah, I mean, definitely when, <clears throat> when some of my people, myself too, and some of my people are like really cramming in and eating up for a meat. Yeah, you got issues. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's there's lots of just heartburn and all kinds of stuff going on. So, but I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of that is just stuffing fifty pounds into a twenty five pound sack. You know, you're oh, yeah, you're gonna have problems. Yeah, we're just putting so much in; it's just hard for the body to keep up. Right. So, uh, any listeners, if you're just joining us, a few weeks ago we did a an episode on the cost of you know heavy bulking. Um, and like Phil always says, you know, don't don't think that elite performance is synonymous with health. That's not, that's not, <laughs> not at all. Not the case. Could, and I guess make a quick quick comment here. Actually, uh, a, a question for you guys. So, certainly, right now we're in a time when uh, people are more sensitive, more aware of digestive issues. So, like you know, certainly celiac and gluten sensitivity and IBS and uh, all this stuff about probiotics and the microbiome and all that stuff are in the news are very much in people's awareness. So the question I would have for, you know, the science science types among us would be like, you know, how do you compensate for that in a study? So that is, if something is sort of more in the media and more in the public awareness, you're gonna get more reporting of those conditions, I would think. So how do you control for that when you're doing a study like over time, where you say, okay, what's the incidence of IBS, uh, you know, in relation to such and such a behavior? Um, is there some ways of, of, of controlling for that, or you just kind of roll the dice and you know hope people are, I don't know, being being honest or understanding that suddenly they go, oh, I have celiac or I have gluten sensitivity. Does that make question make sense? I think you're getting a little bit at self-report versus what kind of clinical markers you're looking at, mm -hmm. and I think both are useful. And again, I'm not a gut expert, but I think some of the 
markers for gut even dysbiosis are debatable. Even, you know, we've had Dr. Sarah Campbell on here too of what's even normal, right? Phil's had his Mm -hmm. poo tested and we've seen some pretty big changes with that too that they hadn't really seen before. So I think it's what markers are you trying to look at? How replicable are are those markers in humans, right? Animal studies are a little bit easier to do. And then to your point, Andrew, like how does that relate to self-report uh, mm-hmm. also? Mm-hmm. It's often a what limitation. What are your thoughts, Lonnie? Yeah. I, I just think, first of all, you just you – research designs have limitations, right? And if one of your right. limitations is self-report – you know, we know people over-report or some groups under-report or, or whatever it might be. Even in this, this study that we were just talking about with uh, Dr. Narula and those guys, essentially um, they did make a comment about not knowing when people changed their diets. They're assuming, I think, on some level constancy. Um, when you do intervention trials, if you want something that's cause and effect, right, you've got a control group. And so we would do like a three-day diet log, not just a food frequency record like this, but something more detailed at the beginning, the midpoint, like maybe week six, and then again in week 12. And that's how we're trying to keep an eye on is their diet relatively steady. I mean, the mm-hmm. assumption, of course, of a three, day, three or four-day food log is that that's representative of someone's all-the-time diet. Um, right. And it is more true than you might think, especially if you do two weekdays and a weekend day, because, of course, we eat differently on the weekends. But And, Mike, it's a good point. We, I, we just read a paper a couple of weeks ago about the quest for objective intake markers, you know, like looking for lycopene to indicate a certain food or looking for different blood markers that objectively verify intake. I think that's what you're getting at, Andrew, like, you know, yeah. s- the steadiness of it. It'd be nice not to rely just on self-report, but to kind of spot check the subjects, you know, with yeah. some blood values for sure. Um, yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I got one more real quick. Um, this is partly for Phil. Um, oh. Stunning anti-inflammatory effects of a fermented food diet. Because, Phil, I know you like your a kombucha, right? Yep. Um, so this is from Tara Fernandez through Lab Roots. It says researchers at Stanford have found that consuming fermented foods such as yogurt, sauerkraut, and kombucha tea uh, creates a rich diversity in the gut microflora, thereby diminishing inflammation. And Andrew, you were just talking about this a little bit yourself. Uh, it says uh, four distinct immune cell types showed a dip in activation status with fermented foods. Um, The researchers also uh, showed uh, lower levels of 19 inflammatory proteins in their circulation, including interleukin-6. I remember measuring that in my dissertation after doing some very brutal downhill running, very inflammatory stuff, and watching IL-6 go up. Um, This is what I found interesting. Uh, Researchers in this particular uh, study, there was 36 healthy adult participants over 10 weeks, Um, they did not observe benefits like this anti-inflammatory from a high fiber diet. So they compared the fermented with high fiber. And that made me raise an eyebrow, right? Because that sort of contradicts the hypotheses of of past studies that high fiber diets will feed the right microbiota. You'll have more diversity in your gut and then you'll be less inflamed. But in this one, um, I believe the researchers referred to it as stunning, yeah. it just, you know, the sweeping anti-inflammatory effects. So it'll be interesting if future studies say, no, you know, fermented foods are, are the key and eating lots of fiber in itself may not be as anti-inflammatory as we hoped. So I, I wonder why they have discrepant results. And again, I, this is just a, a surface level uh, report. It's not a deep dive. I don't have the full study. But Phil, are you still drinking your kombucha? Well, I kind of took it to the next level. I'm making a. <laughs> I'm still fermenting a lot of stuff, but uh, like I've been making a lot of ginger beers and things like that lately. So we're <laughs> letting it go longer. Uh, it's definitely fermented, but like right now behind me, I've got four gallons of ginger mint beer that'll be done this weekend, and then mm. I've I'm doing my first mead, and it's in my cabinet. So and that's what oats and raisins and coffee. So mm. ooh, but. Very nice. Yeah, I mean it's it'll it's definitely live. So, you're, you're going back to the old country with me. Uh, I, really am, awesome. I am. I am. 
And yeah, I wanted to try it. So basically, I raised bees too. So I had honey. So I was like, yeah, we're going that route. I want to try it. That is old school. So, yeah. No, I mean it's 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 fun. Well, yeah, we do we do kombucha and things like that, and that that's scary looking compared to this. You get that big freaking living animal inside there, but yeah, it's delicious. Hmm. And that if if you let it go a little too long, you've got alcohol. So, uh, hmm. but yeah, we we drink that in, on a regular. So right. I think it's pretty easy to make, isn't it? It is. All you do is you get the, they call it a SCOBY, is what mm-hmm. the organism is. And then three, four days later, you've got a gallon of that stuff. And whereas you'd buy a bottle for way too much at the store. <laughs> and you can flavor it how you want. You know, you stop it whenever you want. You just taste it every day. Mm. And it depends on the sweetness you want and whatever. And then we also have control over the ingredients. We tend to use quality stuff and... Not saying that other people don't, but it's questionable when you're yeah. mass producing anything. So, sure. um, yeah, we know that the stuff we buy is quality, or we grow it here. <clears throat> so, and and go with it. But yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I had a student right. that was making like home brew, but it, it, it does make you wonder. Like, if you're sort of a noob at it and you're just living in a dorm or something, how are you doing this? It's not going to be with the kind <laughs> of kind of the way you do it, Phil. You know, it's a lot easier than you'd think, though. Um, it's ah, like for four gallons of my ginger beer, I've probably got a total of a half an hour into it. But wow, wow. the time, the rest of it is just, just do your thing. You know, you just let it do its stuff. So just leave it alone and walk away. Uh, yeah, you just got to make sure you're clean. You know, I, I use all stainless steel stuff that's been sanitized, and you know, you don't. I don't want to grow something else in there. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. So. That's yeah, I've cool. got a sourdough starter that's about. 10 years old now there you go. Yeah, and uh, you just keep feeding that sucker and like you said it's not labor intensive to make you know stuff that's fermented it's just it's just time intensive you're not doing yeah. anything it's just doing it's work it's magic yep I think and that's the problem I mean most people want a kombucha they want it now right I want to grab one <laughs> I want to wait a week you know mm-hmm. <laughs> we just constantly keep things going so we just always have it you get tired of it like the kombucha we'll get on kicks where we're going through a ton and then uh inevitably that goes away so you just refrigerate it and that's fine all it does it doesn't kill the thing it just kind of goes to sleep you know kind of <laughs> like yeast does yeah. and then once you're ready to go again you pull it out and warm it up so hmm. yeah. interesting yeah. Yeah. very cool just swinging back to the uh the um sort of probiotic angle here it does seem like we're in the you know, as, as a as a popular media guy it seems like we're in this inevitable phase where now the pendulum is kind of swinging wildly. It seems like everyone was talking probiotics a couple of years ago and fermented foods. And now it's kind of, you know, we're in the oscillation phase. Some people are saying, ah, oh, forget it. It's no, not a big deal. And now we have the study saying, hey, maybe it is useful. And we'll see where, you know, that that level ultimately winds up at the end. Yeah. I admit, I mean, I'm I'm not usually swayed by one study, but when researchers use words like stunning and they measure 19 different inflammatory proteins that were reduced, like I've mm. never drank kombucha, mm. never tried it. I get, maybe never? I should. Oh wow, give it a shot. Maybe Some I them, should. You just gotta search. Some of them, are, uh, there's a, a wide variety of tastes to it. Oh so, yeah, you know, don't judge one off one. You know, some of them are oh. like, oh, I'll never touch that again. Um, <laughs> right, but, that's good advice. So. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, you know, listeners, if, if you guys have a good source, I'm not probably going to be making this stuff myself um, anytime soon. But if so you've got a good source, I'd love to hear it. Just send us an go to ironradio.org. You could send us a, send us an email. Okay. Um, that's all I've got. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Um, before we get to the topic of the day, talking about the influence of media and just the information process for exercise and nutrition info, I uh, wanted to get a little bit more background on you, Andrew, since you work as an editor for different magazines. You've been mm-hmm. publishing articles for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And you work as a trainer also, too, which is really cool. So you have actual real-world experience. Um, <laughs> How did you get kind of started down that dual path? Uh, yeah. If, well, first of all, let me just say, hugely honored to be here. Um, you, you guys listen to your, your podcast every week, and... It's just so refreshing. I, I get a lot of ideas for articles from uh, all three of you, actually, and just you help refine my thinking around fitness and health, and um, you know, help me take a second look at things that seem superficially, 
you know, interesting or intriguing. And um, anyway, I just love what you guys are doing and thank you very much for all your efforts. Um, so as far as me, I, I started a long, long time ago. Um, I was, I, I had asthma as a child. I still do have asthma. And um, so when I was growing up, you know, I had athletic impulses and um, uh, sort of inclinations, but I, I was held back by um, this um, condition that I had. And the asthma medications, I don't know if you guys follow this at all, but they were basically, you know, back in the 70s when I was growing up, it was, uh, you know, they pump you full of caffeine and, uh, you know, inhaled corticosteroids and sort of hope you did okay, you know, and <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't the best. Like with all know? that. Yeah, exactly. So just picture, you know, a, a, a you know, five-year-old kid on about 20 cups of coffee and, you know, it's not, not pretty sight. Um, <laughs> and, and they still can't breathe. So anyway, so that was kind of my, my, uh, my initial background. And so I was drawn to like, you know, I had, I, I, you know, I would read the comic books and I was really into that whole mythology and that idea that, you know, the, the, the sickly weak kid could transform into, you know, something powerful and strong. And, um, I think I was in fifth grade. We were doing the, the presidential physical fitness challenge. I think you guys know oh, about that, but yeah, yeah I remember yeah. that one. So that's, yep. that's the one. Yeah. You guys remember. So Horrible. yeah, I think it started <laughs> with like, yeah, terrible, right? The worst thing, like let's, let's compare you guys on all these indices of fitness and put post everyone's score on the wall. Um, and then not teach you how to get better at any of it. Just, no, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then they test you the next year, and it's just yep. the same. Um, same. <laughs> yeah, I think it was started by Eisenhower or, or Kennedy about because there was a thing that showed that American kids were less fit than European kids, and so this is terrible because you need to be fit to fight the communists or whatever. Anyway, um, I, I, I was really obsessed with getting good at the flex arm hang, and so which is the top of a chin up hole. And so I tried it once and I had, you know, I got something dreadful, like 10 seconds. And then, so I was like, all right, we have about three weeks to the actual test and I actually worked at it. You know, I went to this tire swing in my backyard and I started working on that and I actually got so I could do it for something like 60 seconds. So I had newbie gains on the flex arm hang. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I got a really good score on the thing at the end. And that was kind of this light bulb moment where I was like, oh, wow, you actually can you know, transform yourself. You can you can work at something, get better at it, and and that's the kind of most mind blowing thing about what we do is like, you can start at point A, do some you know do do some of the right activities you guys talk about, and wind up you know much stronger and much more capable. So that was kind of the first light bulb moment for me. So I started lifting weights, kind of right around there, and kept doing kept doing it. I get into theater at some point and drama. I was in so this is my this is my non-linear trip through fitness, um, and uh, actually wound up in graduate school for theater. And while I was there, we we had you know voice class and acting class and movement class. I was like, movement class? What's the point of that? That's you know I'm I'm trying to get fit over here. I want to be an action hero, you know. And uh, the 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 teacher kind of took me aside and this other guy aside who were really into lifting weights. The teacher's name was Jane Ridley. She was great. And she was like, okay, you guys are really into strength training, and that's awesome. But that's not, at some point, that's, there's more to the picture of wellness and health and moving well than just having big muscles and being strong. And so we were, of course, totally confused. We were testosterone riddled kids. And, but over time, we were doing all these exercises that are about you know, efficiency and finding mobility and a kind of flow and fluidity in the way that you move because the point was not necessarily to be the biggest and the strongest person you know in a play or in a in a movie or whatever tv series or whatever on but to have a body that was expressive and um spontaneous and open to impulse and all these other things that i had no idea you know I, it didn't make it even make any sense to me um but i started to actually loosen up right and i started to actually be uh, be able to access both things, right? The, the, the kind of yin and the yang, the strength and the power, and then also the, the ease and the flow. And that really intrigued me, that idea of kind of having both sides of the coin. And I became, you know, really interested in, you know, watching great athletes, you know, like someone like Bruce Lee, Lonnie, I know you've been a martial artist in the past and you see, okay, well, it's not just about strength. It's also about, you know, that, that, relaxation that degree of you know he says be water my friend right so that degree of being able to be easy and whip like in your movements right i got into martial arts actually for yeah so 
that's about that finding that efficiency and that ease. So that kind of percolated for a long time and somewhere along the line in, in graduate school, I discovered the, this method called the, the Feldenkrais method, which is all about cultivating these, um, these aspects of wellness and health, ease, relaxation, efficiency, you know, dialing up proprioception. And I found that all these things really added to um, added to my strength and athleticism, and it really was complementing. So I was getting stronger in the gym, I was getting faster in the martial arts studio, and I was becoming a more expressive and available and um, skilled actor at the same time. So all these things were kind of getting pulled into the mix. I acted professionally for about eight or 10 years, uh, and then I started uh, transitioning or adding the, the fitness thing. I, I got my first fitness certification about 2003 and um, started working with people. You know, I was like, okay, I've got my fitness cert. I'm all ready to go. And then you actually get thrown into the, the, the fitness world where you're dealing with actual clients and you go, all right, how much of this stuff is actually applicable? And so I was kind of, you know, with a life preserver, I was desperately trying to figure out how to work with these people. I started, you know, filtering in some of these methods that I was using in graduate school and I'd used to, um, again, become more open and more mobile and more free in my in my movement. And that seemed to be um, really effective for these people. So, you know, I work with again, I was I was trained to work with people who were, you know, super fit and kind of ready to go. And then someone would come in and they'd be, you know, 60 years old and they hadn't gotten, a, gotten out of a chair in 20 years. And that's a very different you know set of circumstances. So anyway, started doing that for uh with, with my training and then sort of coincide with that. I started a, a, a blog, a uh, member blogs. I was <laughs> doing that for a while <laughs> and I got approached based on this is back in the day when this could happen, but I got approached by, um, Jen Sinkler, who at the time was the fitness editor experience life. And she said, Hey, you yeah. want a magazine? I said, Nope, but I would, you know, I, it's you know better to get paid for writing than, than not. And so that started uh, a relationship with that that particular outlet that continues to this day. That was in about 2009, and um, I'm a contributing editor over there. And then that, I eventually a couple years after that, I approached Men's Health and I started writing for them. I write for them pretty regularly, and then a bunch of other outlets um, sporadically. I've written for the the um, Open Fit blog and um, uh, onit.com and even had something on Teen Nation at one point. Muscle and Fitness, RIP. Let's just have a moment of silence for Muscle <laughs> and Fitness. No longer with us, but I was writing for them for a while. Um, and then I wrote a, a couple of different, I, I co-authored a couple of different fitness books, a process which we can uh, dish about at some point if you wish as well. Um, and so it all continues. Uh, I, I continue to write. I continue to train people uh, both online and in person. Um, I've got a, uh, a coaching uh, system that's largely based on, uh, and I credit him uh, quite explicitly, uh, largely based on Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, Flex Diet. I, I coach people sort of in, in a group setting about laying in those habits and trying to um, – uh, filter in better behaviors around food and sleep and all those things. And at the same time, I teach an online uh, fitness uh, class. I'll teach it uh, here coming up in about an hour and a half, uh, four days a week. And that's basically the um, the origin story and, then, and the general picture of uh, how I got to be where I am now. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. And also, big thank you for having the Flex Diet Cert in men's health online last year i think so oh yeah, yeah. appreciate absolutely it. yeah yeah be awesome <laughs> cool um well we're going to take a short break and then we'll get yep. into the topic of the day of how is information i guess more in the modern age distributed and a little bit into the background and uh I don't. I don't want to say underbelly, make it all sound like it's seedy, but <laughs> Go ahead. of the the magazine industry now. So. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto 
I don't do it because, I mean, look at me. Come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text the Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it. Do it now. I Am Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. For this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Okay, listeners, after more than a decade of joining us on the podcast airwaves, you can now also become viewers on YouTube. This is not our usual simple backup of the audio show, but rather a growing body of video taste tests covering various foods of interest to nutrition enthusiasts, bodybuilders, and powerlifters. From within YouTube, simply search for Iron Radio Taste Test or Nutrition Radio Taste Test. In about 15 minutes, we cover taste and texture similar to other products, uh, usefulness to the co-hosts, and whether we would recommend the product to certain clients. You may even want to watch our podcast feed or Facebook group for which products are coming down the pike so you can taste test them with us. Join us for this new monthly project. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> Hey, we're back here on Iron Radio with Coach Phil Stevens, Dr. Lonnie Lowry, and myself. And we're talking with Andrew Heffernan about the magazine and kind of the info distribution, especially for more general population uh, info. I guess my first question is, what do you think the trajectory is of standard magazines? One of the things I would not want to do right now would be to running a print magazine i think <laughs> that would be very difficult but maybe i'm wrong maybe everything kind of goes in waves and maybe people are wanting to go back away from media and get out of social media and actually get something in print so i'm not sure um, but what are your thoughts kind of on where the the industry is going because as you mentioned muscle and fitness is no longer around mm -hmm. and just seen Many magazines drop off. The handful mm -hmm. of descriptions I have, I still like getting magazines in the mail. Mm -hmm. I always look at how thick they are as kind of a judge of, hmm, I wonder how long this is going to be around. <laughs> <laughs> That's And you wouldn't be wrong on that, yes. Uh, I have noticed uh, some um, some leaning out, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, they're down to, you know, sub 10% body fat at this point. Um yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I wish I had a crystal ball. I mean, I think, um, yeah, more and more people and, you know, my uh, daughter's generation are, are getting their information straight online. Um, I do. And so whether or not print magazines are actually around, uh, you know, in 10 years um, in any in any form, uh, I, I don't know. I, they're, they're definitely, like you said, the, the, the herd is being thin. Um, but I, I do think that you can still uh, discern a difference between the outlets that are trying to do it right and the outlets that are not. Um, you, you know, I, I think that I think that men's health and experience life both have a lot of integrity. Um, I write for I write for both of them. Um, and then there's a lot of just a lot just a lot of crap out there. So as readers and consumers, I think we probably just have to be all the more. Um, careful and discerning about how we choose those outlets and um and as on my side as the writer and the creator of this content you know i can't let myself get sucked into the vortex of 
just putting crap out there because, you know, these different um, yawning, you know, uh, um, just so such hunger, they have such hunger for more and more content. They just want to fill, you know, pixels. Um, and so you just have to be really careful about uh, about what you do, both both on the again on the creator side and on the consumer side as well. How would uh, somebody know, like, if they're looking yeah. for a better magazine, or maybe, you know, a lot of times it's not transparent to the reader that, you know, the main editor changes or even mm-hmm. the parent company changes, and so you may be reading X magazine for years, and all of a sudden, and this has happened to me, I'm like. What the hell? Maybe they just had a bad issue, and then you read the next one. You're like, "What the hell happened?" You know, and then you realize it was you know bought or sold, or there's major changes. So uh, you couldn't even necessarily go by brand per se. But how would you kind of mm-hmm. determine what's better versus worse? I guess that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, you have to be a critical reader, uh, and that's you, you can't just read passively and, and and take the take the information just on the on the surface. Um, obviously you gentlemen are, are great at this. You're always kind of got, you got your kind of BS meters, uh, up there, but you know, some simple ways of doing it is, does the article have any quotations or citations in it? I mean, Mm. you know, we're, we're not, we're not about in popular media. And sometimes I talk to science types and they're like, we need to cite every single study. It's like, okay, well, yes, you know, we'll say, we'll refer to a study, you know, we can't have a million footnotes is not how it goes. But um, if a if an article is just if you see no quotations and no citations, no reference to any sort of um, reliable authority figure, well, you're just you're then you're just reading someone's, um, you know, pontificating, bloviating opinion. <laughs> and um, that, you know, that can be great. You know, if any of you guys wrote an article, I would sit up and pay attention, you know, and had no citations. But Phil told me how to improve my deadlift uh, in, you know, 500 words or a thousand words. I would pay very close attention because Phil has a hell of a lot of experience and know how on how to do that. On the other hand, um, you know, if Joe Blow at the local gym, who's just got his weekend's CrossFit certification, tells me how to deadlift, I'm probably not going to listen that hard. Um, so just very simply, you know, are, are there, are there, um, are there citations? Are there references to authority? And then is there any, I mean, this is, again, it's a question of, of reading critically. Is there any kind of subtlety in the writing? You know, um, I, I know this drives you gentlemen crazy when you, when you see stuff that is so overblown They've taken some kernel of qualified truth in the scientific literature and they've just, you know, exploded it to create some sensational headline. And that's, that happens in the popular media. We can talk about that. Um, you know, there is always some interplay between, you know, the cold hard facts of science and then the, the need to move product and get eyeballs on your site or your, or your magazine. On the other hand, if it's so overblown and so too good to be true, it generally is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think, online and print magazines have changed because online you can get live statistics all the time of how many eyeballs are on your page to even you know some programs will do like key tracking of where people click and where do they move so you get this almost instantaneous uh-huh. feedback yep so i often i often wonder if magazines are more biased to that <coughs> short-term interaction more so than the long-term mm-hmm. because one they can easily quantify it and someone in the accounting office can change it into dollar signs right away mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. there's less maybe attention paid to long-term maybe vision or where they want to go does that yeah. make sense uh it, hell yes and um you know god help you you're pulling back the curtain on uh, you know the great wizard of oz here <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And it kind of, I mean, it depends outlet to outlet. Um, sure. but, uh, but absolutely. And it kind of drives me crazy. I know we'll get assignments that, and, and there will be, you know, Oh God, like online workshops about how to word things, what keywords to drop in there, how to, 
mm-hmm. you know, spin the phraseology so that you get more, so people just click on it more. And it's just all about that, that search engine. You know, how is your, how, you know, how do you get your stuff? That's that's the the golden, you know. Uh, fleece or whatever, not the right word, but golden chalice that everyone's chasing is just more eyeballs and more, you know, higher up on the Google search. And um, it's it's really, you know, it's, it's fine. I get it. It's commercialism, but it's also, it's a little bit of the uh, tail wagging the dog there, right? It's like, you're not really interested in you know, what, serving the reader, serving what the reader really needs right. to get fitter, get healthier, all those things, but rather what's going to kind of appeal to um, their, 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 what, what the bright shiny object that they're currently interested in, you know? Um, so yeah, there, there is a fair amount of that. The, you know, the good outlets will, <coughs> will, uh, will comment on, uh, you know, try to have a, an article that, that maybe sheds some light on the latest, the newest, latest thing, not in an unqualified way, not in a critical way, right? So you say, okay, um, I don't know, whatever it might be, the, the keto diet, you know, and instead of writing an article about how amazing and perfect the keto diet is and how you're going to lose so much weight and feel amazing and, you know, deadlift a thousand pounds on the keto diet, you know, you, 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 you actually, I'll actually consult someone like you, Mike, and go, okay, what is this really all about? How can it help us? What are the pros and cons? And write that article instead of the, you know, the one that, um, that is just going to, you know, get everyone excited about the newest shiny object. Yeah. What thoughts or questions do you have, Lonnie, and also Phil? Because I know you guys have done work for magazines and in the past, so you have experience both on the outside of submitting and reading and also on the inside, too. We, You know, we used to call that yellow journalism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now it's just clickbait and clickbait's okay. And I, yeah. and I get it, Andrew. I mean, you do have to drive some attention to your site. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean... I should just let Phil talk about it because I more or less with, <laughs> withdrew from social media. I'm probably more salty than you. Yeah. <laughs> Dash of salt from Lonnie and Phil. <laughs> uh, All right, salt uh, up. Salt up, boys. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I mean, I question from a viewer and from somebody that's on the inside, you know, I just quit even – entering articles or submitting articles mm-hmm. due to the fact because it, it got to a point where like I'd send an article and they'd be like yeah that's neat but can you dumb that down and it's like, <laughs> no why would I do that you know you're, just, you're too analytical you're talking about lever arms and this and that it's not just about how to get an 800 pound deadlift no that's how you get it mm, right <laughs> you know? like, yeah raise your bar I mean are your are your listeners that dumb Mm-hmm. Right, it's the dumbing mm-hmm. down of America, right? Yeah, it, it was the, it was very depressing. It got to the point where it's like, I'll just post them on my own site, you know. I don't, you know. Um, and we definitely saw a change. I mean, what would you say drove the change in? I don't know. I'd say it was like the early two thousands to now. There mm-hmm. there was a huge change in in the content, and it used to be that qualified professionals were were called upon to create articles, and mm-hmm. then we see a shift to <sighs> popular people. In like me, you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean, the people who were getting, the people who were getting articles published mm-hmm. were those who got the most hits. Yeah. Yep. Various social media. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think it's again, it's, I think we have a little uh, tail wagging the dog thing. Um, you know, we you see this, the social media star, and they're elevated because they have thus many this many followers or that many followers. And um, yeah, it's trouble. It can definitely be yeah. trouble. I mean, I would say I, I, I will not mention any names, but we not too long ago, um, you know, it happened where uh, there was somebody in the popular in this sort of social media stratosphere where. They were approached by one of the outlets that I write for. Hey, create this article on this thing, and they don't. They did. They didn't know how to write an article that was supported and um, well researched and authoritative. Right? It was just, yeah. oh, I'm going to just put kind of put my opinion out there. Mm-hmm. And um, and then 
the the editor, who was a smart guy, was like, "Oh boy, we need to really work on this to to actually support it and turn it into something that's mm -hmm. um, that's valuable and and um, you know informative." So it was kind of the reverse of what you're talking about, yeah. your experience. Yeah. Like you came in with a wealth of detail and you know authoritative um, uh, support in in what you were coming up with, and th in this case, it was it was the opposite. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there's a happy medium. I mean, I, 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 there I, I go ahead. No, there is. And I mean, I was just going to add that I, as somebody who owns businesses, I understand it too. Yes. And that's why I don't get too salty. It's like, yeah, they, yeah, they got to make money. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I got to stay afloat. <laughs> yeah. Especially in an age where, especially like print magazines are dead, Oof. you know? So, I mean, it's like, oh, okay. I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, so yeah, you but know, I, st I mean, I still like to say that, or, or, I, I just fervently have to believe that there is a meeting of the mind somewhere where, uh, because I have talked to the other side of the coin is I've talked to academics and really smart people. And all I want is some, I just want some clarity and, mm -hmm. and something that is stated in a, in, in a simple way. And that the person is willing to say, okay, for general, for the general population, I don't need to hear about, you know, those crazy yeah. outliers, but for the general population, what information can you give me that's going to help my readers, you know, in some way get fitter, stronger, faster, whatever it may be. Right. And some of these people, God help them. They can't do it. They yeah. go, they'll talk to me for an hour and a half, literally, and a lot of big words. And I'm, totally convinced that they're authoritative, but I can't get a single nugget out of that yeah. that I can apply to my people. And so it's yeah. you know, that I can forgive to my readers. And so it's like, there, there's that angle on it too, is like, if, if we're going to meet in the middle somewhere, I have to try to smarten myself up and go, okay, what is this person, uh, you know, what is the, the essence of what this person is saying and how can it help my readers? And then on the other side, the, the academic has to go, all right, how can I take this wealth of 20 years of understanding and knowledge and boil it down to something that is generally applicable. And again, yes. some people can't do it. So yes. um, I, 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 th I think we may be closer friends than we think. <laughs> no, I agree. There are definitely people on the other end of the spectrum that like can't. Uh, I've seen this in all fields I'm in. Like I battled, I have an art degree and yeah. I battled in my art degree that people entrenched in that field love talking in a way that is not understandable by the layman. Yes. And I got in battles in that because I, you know, they'd be like, well, the tenebrism is, I was like, oh, you mean like extensive use of light and shadow? No, no, the tenebrism. You got <laughs> oh, why, why can't we speak like fucking people? You, know? <laughs> you don't need to say, you know, dumb it down. And that's yeah. one of the great things in history has been, you know, making complex things simple. That's the sign of a teacher. Yeah. You know, if you can't relate this, and I talk about this with new trainers all the time, they'll mm -hmm. come in and you're, you're, you need to sublex your infraspinatus. It's like, they don't fucking care. Shut up. Tell them to do this. You know, you yeah. know, yeah. quit using all those words. They don't care about the average athlete, the average reader, the average person interested in fitness does not care about their supraspinatus and how it, where the insertion is and this and that. Right. Um, you got to be able to relate to the layman and, yeah. you know, take complex ideas and dumb them down. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. So. And, there's, and there's an art to that. I mean, like, yes. I, you know, I always, I always love in, on your show when Mike and Lonnie, you know, you'll come up with all the complex kind of ins and outs of things. Then you say, Phil, what do you think? And Phil will go, have this nice little pause and a sigh. <laughs> <You> go, <laughs> go, this is what I think, you know, right. and it's great. I mean, it's, it's both, both perspectives yeah. are really, really valuable because yeah, at some yeah. at some point you need rubber hits the road. Yeah. yeah. And um, that's that's where I think that's where I think I can be helpful to, you know, this, the science people and say, all right, what what are you guys coming up with? You know, that it, there's a real nugget that can help people where there's where they, we can get traction, you know? Yeah. And if you know, if you're Mike T. Nelson or Alani, you go, well, my bias is this. And then it's clear. And then we go, OK. And then I can say in the article, you know, here's the here's a nod of complexity and then but ultimately mike thinks this you know and then 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 we can talk then we have an article you know right you know what you guys in defense of a lot of scientists there's a lot of talk in some of the the groups that i'm in of trying to 
distill, you know, into literally yeah. a 10 second or a 30 second explanation what you do. And it's, it's funny. There's actually joke websites about describe your dissertation in two sentences, you know, <laughs> and, and what, what they say is comical. It's like, wow, that's it. But it's, it's in their defense, I think. Science, we've been talking about this, this whole show, I think, but is it's evidence-based, it's reductionist. So when you speak to a scientist, and Andrew, I know you see this, I know Mike does, and Phil, when you were trying to moderate stuff, is they want to talk in caveats, right? Because it's reductionist. Yes. You're like, only in this dose or in this population or at this duration or with this machine. And scientists, wants to, well, they want to talk in probabilities, not absolutes. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. opposite of clickbait, right? So that's what mm -hmm. frustrates me is, you know, I love Bertrand Russell. I point anybody to go check out this, um, uh, you know, early 1900s philosopher. But Bertrand Russell said, the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. And that's the problem, <laughs> right? That's the mm -hmm. problem with society. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. want nuance. They don't want reductionists. So they'll say, so... Andrew or Mike, so was it good or bad? And I always say, I don't have a piece of equipment that measures good. I, I don't, I, I don't, I can't respond to that, right? I can tell you at this dose, there was a reduction in X, Y, Z, you know, but that's the problem is we're more opinion-based and cocksure and kind of stupid mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> instead of that, you know, the intelligent and talking in probabilities and being full of doubt. That's my salty mm -hmm. take on this. And you're right. Mm -hmm. And yet you live in a commercial world. We're in this, you know, capitalistic post you know highly developed consumer world where everything is commoditized how do you get some truth out mm -hmm. you know it, it, with the demand for clickbait i guess yeah you know. yeah i mean i think what, what's what's at least a a little bit encouraging about it in the in the fitness world is that you when you're writing about health and fitness as opposed to like you know curing cancer or something um you know life-threatening is like you, you want to give the readers some place to start or an idea like, oh, the, the, here's something to try in the gym. Here's something to try with your nutrition and not overstate it and go, hey, maybe maybe this will work. Maybe this will nudge you a little further along on your fitness journey. And you don't have to overstate it. You don't have to go. This is going to be the, the, the be all end all of, you know, getting ripped and jacked. You can just say, hey, here's here's a there's a little nugget you can try. And again, that's, we, we can generally agree on that yes. uh, from the science side and the, and the, and the gen pop media side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My last comment too, is that if you're an academic, I mean, I never took a communications class when I did my PhD. I barely took technical writing and I had to write technical, you know, it, it seems weird that you do all this stuff in research and everything to get good at this one little tiny area. And then once you're done, the expectation is, well, now you have to communicate it to someone who hasn't done any of that, right? <laughs> right. You're almost like it's a, and if you don't work with people and have to do the application of it, or especially if you're just doing research only, you don't do a lot of teaching, you don't really ever practice the skill set of having to translate something. So like you said, they can understand it, yep. but you're still trying to make it not so bastardized that it's not true anymore either mm -hmm. um and i think if people are in that boat like if they can find someone like yourself a really good editor you can ask them questions to try to get at it and you can both kind of reach an agreement where the academic or the expert says yep that that's correct in the circumstance i'm okay with that right and like you said you give the reader a nugget or something they can actually do at the end of the day and yeah. i mean I remember sending some of my early stuff to like Lou Schuler, and I was like, uh -huh. oh, I think this is pretty good. And you get it back, you're like, whoa, this is way better. <laughs> Shit, it still sounds like me, though. That's amazing. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. It's like yeah. if you can work with really good editors, it just sounds better, but it still sounds like something you would have said. So I find right. that that's. That's just a whole nother skill set I, I don't have. You know, and it's yeah. thankless. It's a thankless job to be an editor. Just, I'm oh, going to yeah. toss that out on Andrew's behalf. Rob used to go on about that all the time. It's just, you're making, yeah, I mean, your stuff is generally quite good to begin with, Mike, let's be fair. But sometimes, yeah, you get stuff that's just garbage. And then, yeah. you know, you almost you almost feel like the editor should be, have the byline, <laughs> right? Because yeah. you're the yeah. one who made it t t taste worthy at all, you know? Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, no, for sure. And I'd like all the blame cannot be laid on the media. 
like from being behind the scenes from places that had editors thing there was things like they would give to us i'm not an editor i'm not an english major but they're like here clean this up and then we'll give it to the editors like very highly respected coaches that would send in a yeah thousand page thousand word article that was one sentence yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like holy crap yes you know, yeah so there are very bright people out there within the field that just don't know how to talk and we all can't be jim windler who was like a division one athlete and a elite power lifter and has a master's in english yeah <laughs> you know that's he's an anomaly you know yeah. so but awesome well, thank you so much. Uh, where can readers learn more about you and your programs and everything else you have going on? Sure. Uh, I, I still have one of those old-fashioned things called a website, uh, andrewhefferman.com. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Yay. <laughs> one of the few. Uh, I also have an AOL uh, email address. Seriously. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you want, yeah, andrewhefferman.com uh, uh, exists. And then, but the, the thing that I, 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 the fire that I stoke most often is probably my Instagram page, Andrew Heffernan Fitness. Um, and so people can kind of follow what I do there. And um, yeah, lots of stuff available on there. If you just want to reach out to me and uh, learn more about the kind of stuff I do, that's how to do it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with us and uh, being so open to talk about it, especially because I know it's, a little tricky on your end because that's your business and you have to work with magazines and get communication out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My pleasure. And once again, a, a, a real, uh, real honor to be on with you guys. Uh, really admire what you do. I guess. All righty. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Especially you're on the West coast getting up early to do this. That's awesome. Oh, Hey, no problem. It's, it's actually quiet out here. I'm not, <laughs> not chasing kids right now. So I'm getting Very nice. Done. Um, thanks a lot. It was fun. Yep. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.